Presenting next will be Dr. Lauren Sardi from the Department of Sociology on disrupting the cultural discourse on routinized male circumcision. Hello. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you about this issue and for bearing with me as I am getting over a very bad cold, so apologies. Um, so to make a long story short, I study why male neonatal circumcision is still practiced in the United States for non-religious reasons, despite the fact that it is not medically necessary and can even result, believe it or not, in death. Uh, this may sound strange to many of you sitting here right now, particularly if you've probably not given much thought about your genitalia or why it may or may not look the way that it does. Uh, yeah, so, but for your information, here are, uh, woo, here are, <laughs> here are some very common reasons uh, that parents have given as to why they've circumcised their sons. So, here we go. Uh, uh, <laughs> but what's also interesting here to note is what happens when we situate this discourse comparatively, meaning that the same arguments we give in this country for circumcising boys are often the same reasons that parents give for cutting the genitals of girls in other countries. Uh, if we take this comparison into perspective, we can see that many of the arguments we give for circumcising boys would not hold up by our own standards, no less, if that child were either born female in this country or if that particular body part uh, weren't part of a boy's penis, oddly enough of all places. Again, we're probably not thought much about this, but what are the differences between male circumcision and uh, female genital cutting, for example, um, which I'll call uh, and refer to here as FGC? We tend to think of male circumcision as a relatively simple, safe, and quick procedure. Uh, and what we see here, though, is that baby boys are, in fact, generally strapped down to what's called a circumstraint. You can see that over on the left. Um, and that's a picture I took myself when I was doing um, field work in a hospital. Uh, not too far away. Um, baby boys are usually given no pain medication at all and as you can probably guess it's it's extremely painful and babies are known to pass out from the pain and if you kind of saw this from the the previous slide uh, uh foreskin on humans is fused to the head of the um the penis or the clitoris at birth so uh, by fused i mean that you would have to forcibly separate foreskin from the the rest of i know sorry <laughs> from the rest of the genitalia, which is, in other words, very similar in nature to forcibly removing your fingernail from your finger. Ooh, okay, yeah, it's, it, it, it's pretty bad. Uh, likewise, we usually think of infibulation, um, which is probably the most extreme form of FGC in which all external genitalia on a girl is removed and um, you know, stuff is sewn together, uh, as the only type of FGC when in fact it occurs only in about 10% of all reported cases. Other more common types include uh, a ritual nick, which is done with a needle as shown here um, in a sterile environment. So how different are these practices when you actually stop to think about it? Uh, Dr. Ronald Goldman uh, has written extensively on the history of male circumcision and FGC, and he's found a surprising number of cultural, historical, and biological similarities between two sets of procedures that we might otherwise think are completely different, and they are noted above here. Uh, as I've written elsewhere, before we point the finger at other countries' practices, maybe we should take a closer look at the practices of our own. Thank you. <laughs> 